Welcome to worship at Fairview Presbyterian Church. My name is the Reverend Stephanie Bishop, and I am the transitional minister here at this little church in Lawrenceville, Georgia. We're so glad you are tuning in this morning. It is the fourth Sunday in Ordinary Time, and it's the first week of summer. I have seen on Facebook pictures of your beach vacations and harvest of fruits and veggies and flowers cut from your yards. Those sights of beauty and life give me hope that this time apart is proving to offer time for relax, relaxation and growth, uh, re relaxing of the body and growth of your spirits. I will ask that you continue to pray for uh, Louise Phillips, who is healing at home right now. There is a list going around on um, email for signing up to take a meal to her once a week. So if you have not seen that list and you would like to, to help out with that endeavor, please get in touch with Margo and also continue to look for emails from Margo that um, tell us about life in the church and also about who needs prayer from us right now and continue to hold these people close in your heart and in your prayers. This morning, I'm glad to say that Cian is once again back here playing the piano for us, and Allison Baskus is our guest liturgist this morning. So let's turn our hearts and minds to worship now with our call to worship. I will sing of your steadfast love, O Lord, and, and proclaim, proclaim your faithfulness to all generations. generations. Your steadfast love endures forever. Your, your faithfulness, faithfulness is as, as high as, as the heavens. heavens. Happy are those who sing your praise and, and extol your, your righteousness, righteousness all the day. Let us confess our sins to God, whose loving kindness endures forever. Let us join in one voice. O oh Lord, you taught us to love you and our neighbor, but we have not lived in right relationship or walked in the light of your love. Forgive us for the wrongs we have done. We know that the wages of sin is death. Yet we trust in your gift of forgiveness, which is freedom and life in Christ. Amen. Sisters and brothers, your sins are forgiven by the mercy of God. Be at peace, for you have been freed from sin, that you may serve with righteousness to the glory and praise of God. Amen. Let us pray. Steadfast God, you greet us as a loving parent and patiently love us beyond all measure. Great is your faithfulness. May we offer that same kindness to all whom we encounter, knowing it is Christ whom we greet as we welcome others. As we hear your word this day, send your spirit to equip and inspire us that your grace-filled hospitality may be the center of our lives. Amen. Hey kids, I hope you've had a good week. I was wondering if you know what is coming up at the end of this week. We have a very special day coming up on Saturday. It's the 4th of July. That is the day that we celebrate our country's freedom from another country. It's what we call Independence Day. And uh, in my memories with my family and friends, we used to have picnics during the day and then we, we would find some place to watch fireworks at night. I don't know if you have had those experiences in the past and I don't know what, uh, what this holiday will hold for us during this pandemic time, but I bet that you can probably see some fireworks at some point. I um, live in Atlanta now, and in my neighborhood, there are fireworks pretty often. There are fireworks on random nights when there are no holidays, and people have very mixed feelings about it. Um, I can't see the fireworks in my house, and my dog gets scared because they're loud, and I hear that other people have those problems with their animals, and sometimes their children are scared too because of, because of the loudness of the fireworks. But if you get to see fireworks, you'll see how pretty and bright and brilliant they are. And that reminded me of a scripture in the Bible that talks about light. And I want to read that for you right now. It comes from Matthew chapter 5 and it's verses 14 through 16. And it says, You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under the bushel basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. And 
I just want you to remember that, that when you see fireworks, let them be a reminder to you that you should show forth your faith in Christ and be Christ's light in the world in the same way, same brilliant, bright way that those fireworks are. You can be bold and even be loud when you are showing your faith and your love of Christ to others. So I hope that you'll remember that this 4th of July. I hope you'll have a fun day, and I hope that you have a good couple of weeks because it will be about two weeks before I see you again. But uh, let's pray before we go this morning. Good and loving God, I thank you for these children and for all those who care for them. I ask that you be with them this week, be with them on the 4th of July, help them have a fun celebration, and help them remember when they see those fireworks that they can be just as bright and just as beautiful and just as bold and even loud when they show your love to others. I pray all of these things in your son's holy name. Amen. Bye, kids. Our scripture reading today is from Matthew chapter 10, beginning at verse 38 and reading through 42. And anyone who does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. He who receives you receives me, and he who receives me receives the one who sent me. Anyone who receives a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And anyone who receives a righteous man because he is a righteous man, will receive a righteous man's reward. And if anyone gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones because he is my disciple, I tell you the truth, he will certainly not lose his reward. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second scripture reading this morning comes from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 6, verses 12 through 23. Therefore, do not let sin exercise dominion in your mortal bodies to make you obey their passions. No longer present your members to sin as instruments of wickedness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and present your members to God as instruments of righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Should we sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you, having once been slaves of sin, have become obedient from the heart to the form of teaching to which you were entrusted and that you, having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to greater and greater iniquity, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness for sanctification. When you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. So what advantage did you then get from the things of which you now are ashamed? The end of those things is death. But now that you have been freed from sin and enslaved to God, the advantage you get is sanctification. The end is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Last week, and probably at least one other time, I have said to you that I find preaching Paul difficult because he was preaching himself that I could read you what he has written in his letter and just let that rest. Maybe I should have noted with the exception of the letter to the Romans. Romans has some great passages that include couplets of verses that we remember and cherish. But reading passages like this one in its entirety can perhaps cause us to get a little lost in all the repetition of words and sentiment that Paul is imparting upon us. Last week, we heard from chapter 5, and I spoke about hope that we have through God. I admitted the disagreeing with Paul's words in his first letter to the Corinthians that the greatest of, of the faith, hope, love, trifecta is love. I argued that the greatest is hope because it affords us the grit and grace to keep going in rough times. 
This week, I have a different disagreement with Paul. It's not so much a, of a disagreement as it is a stylistic difference, a hang up with Paul's writing technique. In order for me to explain, let me use a simplistic but probably well-known riddle or joke. Do you remember this? When someone once told you to say toast and then made you repeat it time and time again, toast, 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 until you were sick of saying it. And then the person asked, what do you put in a toaster? Toast is what most people naturally respond. Of course, the joke is that you just got duped into saying that. You, of course, know that you put bread in a toaster and you pull toast out. When I read these verses from Paul, I notice the word sin permeates the passage. It appears in these nine verses ten times. I imagine if you ask someone who just heard this passage, what should a person do? Sin just might be the answer based on how many times you have just heard that word. Paul probably didn't know what we know now about the human brain and marketing. Or maybe he simply trusts us to follow his train of thought all the way through. Some of his main points are, one, resist sin. Two, be righteous before God. And three, because of being under grace and not law, sin has no rule over us. Let's back up just a little. This passage is not the beginning. We have skipped from last week when we heard the first part of chapter 5 to this week when we have picked up with the middle of chapter 6. I don't need to cover all those verses in between to make today's relevant, but I did want to point out that Paul had more to say about being free from sin prior to our reading. He takes on the argument that if grace abounds when we have more sin, should we sin more to obtain more grace? Of course not, Paul emphatically says. Quite the opposite, and he writes a good deal about our identity being in lockstep with Jesus Christ. This identity is forged in our baptism into Christ and Christ's death. He wants us dead to sin, alive to Christ who died for us, right? His train of thought leads us to this reality. God's fidelity to us through Jesus Christ's death and resurrection is what gives us, affords us, allows us to have, whichever way you choose to frame it, freedom from sin. And this freedom bestowed on us at the time of our baptism then requires our fidelity to God. Another word Paul uses a good deal in this part of the letter is one that we are struggling with because of the heavy connotations it carries today. Paul calls us slaves. But for Paul, slavery can have a good connotation if we are but slaves of righteousness, if we are but slaves to a master who is our loving God, who loves and cares for us with abounding grace that knows no end. Unfortunately, we as humans, especially fairly affluent American humans, we can easily find ourselves to be slaves of something or some things that are far from what righteousness looks like. We find ourselves caught up in all sorts of ways without even realizing we're doing it. Do you check the stock market every day? Are you caught up in a rat race for wealth and prosperity? Do you post on social media and then check to see how many likes or comments you've received? Do you put too much stock in what others think of you? Do you need to buy new clothes every change of season to keep up with the fashion trend? Or how about the latest, greatest technology? Do you fear being left behind or left out as the world marches on? Are you constantly scrambling to the store or elsewhere to buy drugs, cigarettes, or alcohol, or your favorite junk food because you are driven by an addiction? Do you shape your day around your fitness routine driven by a compulsion for optimal health? One preacher says this, to be a slave, as Paul understands it, is to surrender your life to the control of another. When slavery is defined in this way, it turns out we are all slaves of one sort or another. When you hear that and think of the examples I've listed, it's hard to deny that, isn't it? I'm sure my, my list is not comprehensive, but you can likely find yourself in shades of one or more of those habits. These are habits that take time away from focusing on the righteousness that God calls us to. I will admit to you that fitness has had a way of slipping into an obsession level activity for me, especially in stressful times. I have several ways to track how far I run or walk, and I can care a little too much about what that number is like each day. Speaking of stressful times, I currently find I have added something new to my morning routine, which used to consist of simply cereal, coffee, a daily reading and devotional and prayer. Now I systematically check what the daily count is on virus cases. I am bound to this need to be aware of what that number is, and it's hard to let go of worry. 
It's hard to rest in God's fidelity and promise of life eternal when there are just so many difficult things happening in the world right now. It's hard to bask in the freedom God has given us not to sin when there are just so many earthly, deleterious distractions. It's hard to practice the fidelity to God that is required. It's hard to live as free from sin people when sin and the opportunities to do so are all around us. It makes me want to say freedom and fidelity, freedom and fidelity, freedom and fidelity, freedom and fidelity in the hopes that it is then what I am prone to experience and exhibit. If only it were as simple as that. Or we could turn to more words in our Bible, like the ones that Allison read us from Matthew, in which Jesus implores us to follow him. We gain life this way, he promises. The latter verses of that passage speak on how we treat others, words about welcoming and caring for others. We find instruction all throughout our biblical text on how to be righteous people in calling us to fidelity to God. These texts call us to fidelity to one another, to our communities, to our neighbor, who, as I taught the kids last week, really can mean a stranger. It kind of boils down to something as simple as that and I find myself wondering why it is so hard. Daily now, we see people crying out in the streets for justice and equity. Can we remember that God made us all in God's image and gave us all this grace we experience freely for all but, all but who choose to accept it? And can we offer this same grace and love to our fellow humans? An act of love these days can be as simple as spending time listening truly hearing the cries and offering empathy, even as we yet may not have gained true understanding. Daily now, we go out into a world infected by a virus that keeps rearing its ugly head. Science and experts have told us that we can protect one another by wearing a mask in public. This is another simple way we can show love to our neighbor right now. The freedom and fidelity we experience through our God calls us to love our neighbor in this way. I have just offered you two ways to show love in God's world. Neither costs much of anything in the way of time, effort, or dollars, but at this current place and time in history, both can bring great dividends in the effort to spread Christ's love in this earthly place we call home. Fidelity to God is taking that love that God has so freely offered us and offering it to others. We have been set free by grace from the way sin binds us, yet we choose to stay in those chains. We choose to withhold the love we are called to offer, sometimes without even realizing it. On this day, do your best to let go of whatever holds you in bondage, for being in bondage to the things of this world is not God's will for you. On this day, do your best to love your neighbor in an extravagant way that might even just be a simple thing like wearing a mask when you go to the grocery store. And then do it again the next day and the next day and the next until repeating freedom and fidelity isn't necessary to remind you it is so. You will feel it in your heart and in your bones because you have joined Christ in his death so that you may have life eternal. That is the good news of the gospel, and that is the good news of this day and the next and the next forevermore. Amen. Jesus said, Truly I tell you, those who offer a cup of cold water in the name of a disciple will not lose their reward. Beloved, let us offer to God the gifts of our lives and labor. Let us pray. Faithful God, we give you thanks that you have entrusted us with the gift of hospitality and generosity, and that you have set us free to be generous givers of the gifts you so freely give to us. May our, our offerings this day draw us closer to you as we share them with others. For righteousness' sake, amen. I come to this table this morning humbled by what the Holy Spirit can do. You see, the first time that I offered you communion in this format, it felt very strange and isolating to me, and I couldn't imagine that it would be a meaningful experience to you all. But as the weeks went by, I began to hear that it was, that you really were touched 
by the act of communion, even in your own spaces. And so this morning I come to the table joyful, knowing that we are connected in this community in a way that may be being done virtually, but is still being done authentically. And so I ask that you take a few moments now to gather elements in your homes, um, some milk or water or juice if you have it, bread or a cracker, and join me back here to hear the invitation to the Lord's table. This is the joyful feast for the people of God. People will come from north and south, from east and west, and sit at the table at the kingdom of God. According to Luke, when our risen Lord was at table with his disciples, he took the bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. This is the Lord's table. Our Savior invites those who trust him to share the feast that he has prepared. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Praise to you, O God, for all your works. You created the world and called it good and made us in your image to live together in love. You made a covenant with us, and even when we turned from you, you remained ever faithful. Your fidelity to us is tried and true. Therefore, with all creation, we offer your praise. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Creator of all things seen and unseen, you blew the spirit of Christ into apostles and disciples enslaved by sin, freeing your people from death and captivating us with your steadfast love. You raised the body of Christ, the church and the world, to proclaim the good news of salvation. For the sake of the world, we pray, come, Lord Jesus. We pray for all whom you call into the work of the church. May they know the presence of your spirit to strengthen, guide, correct, comfort, and challenge, and help them lead your people in these new and confounding circumstances. We pray for all those whose lives are touched by the church's witness. We pray that we, who have been touched, will spread the word and love of Jesus Christ in far-reaching ways. May those who need it most feel the healing hands of Christ Jesus, serving them with gentleness, kindness, grace, and love. We pray for the world into which you call the church. Help us to be faithful in giving ourselves away for the sake of the gospel. In your spirit, let us show the peace of Christ to a world of violence, offer ways of justice to those we have oppressed, share the bread of heaven with a world of hunger, offer springs of living water to a world of pollution, and lead the way of truth and life with the gifts of faith, hope, and love until you bring the fullness of your new creation. Remembering your boundless love revealed to us in Jesus Christ, we break bread and share the cup, giving ourselves to you to live for him in joy and praise. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts of bread and wine, that they may be for us the body and blood of Christ, and that we may be his body for the world. By your Spirit, unite us with Christ and one another until we feast with him and with all your saints in your eternal realm of justice and peace. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours, Almighty God, now and forever. As our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, 
and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. On the night of his arrest, Jesus gathered his disciples, his friends, into an upper room, and around the table they had dinner. And Jesus, after giving thanks, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, friends, this is my body, broken for you. Each time you eat of it, remember me. And in the same way, he took the cup and he poured. And he said, this is the cup of the new covenant, poured out for you. Each time you drink of it, remember me. Friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This is the body of Christ, broken for you. And this is the blood of Christ, shed for you. Thanks be to God. Sisters and brothers, you have been given the spirit of freedom and saved for the sake of God's love. God's fidelity to you requires that you freely share that love in the world on this day and the next and the next forevermore, knowing that the reward of right relationship is holiness and life eternal. And now may the one who creates, redeems, and sustains you from everlasting to everlasting grant you the grace of peace, holiness, and eternal life. Amen. I've got a home sick for a country to which I Yeah. 